Greetings, introductory calculus-based waves, optics, and modern physics students. I've thrown up some thought-provoking images here with no explanation, but we'll see that all three of these images cannot be discussed thoroughly without a look first at the diffraction of light through a circular aperture. You've been around the block a few times now with diffraction patterns, so you know what we're looking at here. Here's the barrier through which we're passing coherent light. Just think of this as a laser beam or uh, incoming wave fronts from a far away source of circular waves. So that now we're looking at plane waves passing through this time, not a slit or a double slit or a multiple slit or a square hole, but specifically a circular aperture, which is probably the most common aperture that you encounter in cameras, telescopes, corrective lenses, approximately. And much to one's surprise, if you had never seen this before, uh, the shadow, I'm using air quotes, the shadow cast by the circular hole onto the viewing screen is not what you would expect. It's not the, the mere geometric shadow. I think any reasonable person, uh, not having studied this or observed it in a laboratory or real life, would expect that you would see a circular dot of light with the same diameter as the diameter of the hole. But evidently that is not what happens. Here's a high resolution image here of laser light forming the diffraction pattern from a circular aperture. It's, it's not laser light that's being passed through a series of concentric rings cut out of a barrier. I mean, that would be difficult to manufacture. First of all, uh, this light really did come from one circular hole. So what is going on here? Not the greatest diagram, but at least it's got some nomenclature here that we need. And I say not the greatest because if you had a point source of light right here, then the light incident upon this circular aperture would not be a plane wave. We do need this term right here. The, the central bright spot in the diffraction pattern from a circular aperture is referred to as Aries disk or simply the Aries disk, named after a physicist who made contributions to optics. And let me go back and point out, do you notice how the intensity drops off rather quickly with radial distance from the center of the pattern? So concentric rings, it looks like the, the width of the rings is gradually getting smaller and there's definitely a decay of intensity with distance. We've already looked in some detail at the diffraction pattern from a single slit. And I've already described the general procedure for simulating in a program like Python, the diffraction pattern that you would see on a screen. So what you can do with the computer is to represent your hole or your aperture with a, a set of points, maybe something like a hundred, and then send waves out from all of those points. Maybe it's better to start from the screen actually. So take your observation screen and choose a number of pixels that's reasonable. Again, if you ask the computer to calculate the total intensity at a billion points on the screen, that's going to take a while. So maybe you've just chosen, what is this? One, two, three, four, six by six, 36 pixels on the screen. And for each of those pixels, you say, hey, what's the phase of the wave arriving at this point from this point in the circular aperture? What's the wave arriving at this point from this point in the circular aperture? So again, if you've chopped up your aperture into 100 pixels, that's 100 calculations you'll have to do to find the total electric field at that point on the screen. You square that, there's your intensity. And then you repeat that for every point on the screen. And of course, I had to do that in Python. It was surprisingly easy to implement, especially since I already had the scripts ready from the single slit and the multiple slit. So doing exactly what I just described, using the, uh, the progressive plane waves that we've been discussing for weeks now, I wind up with this diffraction pattern. And this letter W, which you've seen in your book, will be used to describe the width of the airy disk. That's that central bright spot. And it's really from, do you see how there's a dark band between the airy disk and the first concentric ring? Uh, I could call that the first diffraction minimum. So the width W is really from the center of the dark ring on one side to the center of the dark ring on the other side. I guess it's not too surprising that that's what the pattern 
of diffraction looks like from a circular aperture because you can sort of think about it like this. Take your single slit and revolve it about an axis coming out the center of the slit. And that's sort of what a circular aperture is, right? Uh, not, not so much sort of, I mean, it really is that. If you did sweep out this uh, or rotate the single slit about that axis, you would sweep out a circular region. So that makes it somewhat plausible that the diffraction pattern you can expect from a circular aperture might look like the diffraction pattern you would get if you took the single slit diffraction pattern and revolved it about an axis perpendicular to the center. Don't pay too much attention to the accidental asymmetry here. Doesn't this look a lot like what we just observed in Python? Now, of course, that's not the correct way to derive the diffraction pattern from a circular aperture. You would need to use the math appropriately, do an integral, but uh, it's a simple way to make the result plausible. Okay, so here's a graph that you've seen before. Typically, we use the letter A, lowercase a, for the width of a single slit, and we've looked at the intensity pattern on the screen as a result of diffraction of coherent light through that slit. There's this uh, central maximum. This is the first minimum, second minimum, et cetera. I may have casually mentioned that the, the function which, which describes the intensity is the square of a sinc function. It's, it's a lot like sine of x over x. That's the so-called sinc function. And then you square that. Um, and this is the formula that we developed for the location or the angular positions of the minima. P is an integer that can take on the values of one, two, three, et cetera. And we saw that the wider the slit width is, or I should say the wider the slit is compared to the wavelength, the smaller the width of the central maximum, right? Because if you make the denominator bigger then this whole quantity is smaller, that means the sine of the angle is smaller. That means the angle itself is smaller. So as you open up the width of the slit, the uh, central maximum gets narrower. And we're going to see that the same is true for the circular aperture diffraction pattern. So again, we call this the airy disk, not the whole thing, just that center bright spot. And you can see from this right triangle here that the Y coordinate uh, anywhere on the screen can be expressed as uh, the adjacent side times the tangent of that angle. And then we looked at the small angle approximation. As long as y is much less than L, then we're talking about a very small angle and the tangent of theta can be swapped for the sine of theta. And then we can take this right here and plop it in. Yeah, so what have I done here? Uh, if we're looking at the very first minimum then P would take on the value one, am I right? And so the sine of theta would just be lambda over A. I've taken that and plugged it in here. So the Y coordinate of this first minimum would be L times lambda over A. And here's a good way of thinking about that that I have not yet mentioned. This is a dimensionless ratio, lambda over A. And it's basically the angle. Lambda over A is basically the, the angle that you're talking about. If you then multiply that angle by this outward distance, you get the lateral distance. So distance to screen times the angle basically gives you the, the lateral coordinate at that point on the screen. Okay, so if the location of the first minimum is L lambda over A, then you can see that the width of the central maximum would just be two times that, which is where this comes from, two L lambda over a. Now this, this may seem trivial, but I prefer to write it this way rather than putting L in the numerator. If you just write this as 2L lambda over a, you'll lose sight of the fact that what you're really doing is taking this dimensionless quantity, which is very closely equal to the angle to the first minimum, and then you're multiplying by a distance to get another distance, right? Distance times angle gives you another distance. Okay. Well, keeping this formula in mind, it should be no surprise that the formula for the width of the airy disk looks similar. Because going back to uh, several slides ago, 
we expect that the uh, circular aperture diffraction pattern should look like what you get if you take a single slit diffraction pattern and revolve it. And sure enough, the only difference is that this coefficient up front is 2.44 rather than two. So a little wider than you might predict if you tried to just match it up exactly with the single slit diffraction pattern. Now, where does this number come from? Unfortunately, we cannot derive that, that coefficient because it requires a little bit more calculus. You actually have to do the, the integral from optics. So now is a good time to go into Python and show how this diffraction pattern results from light passing through this aperture. And I will use the procedure suggested by this diagram. I'm back in Spider. Here is the letter capital D, which we'll be using consistent with your book for describing the diameter of the circular aperture. So lowercase a is, is reserved for a single slit width, capital D for the diameter of the circular aperture. And just like in my previous scripts for other diffraction patterns, I'm using the letter lowercase b for the dimensions of the screen patch on the observation screen, or you could call it the observation window. That's the size of the region where I'm actually going to compute the interference pattern. Here you can choose your wavelength, and I'm making a little note here that this number is in nanometers. Now, the fact that it's in nanometers means at some point later in the script, I'm going to have to insert that power of 10, 10 to the negative ninth for nano. In fact, that probably pops up somewhere. Here it is. I put it into the wave number. Remember K, the wave number, is 2 pi over lambda. And here's where I counted for the fact that my 500 actually means 500 nanometers. I'm introducing the letter pi, which we'll need. And focus your attention here. Well, of course, you're going to focus your attention here because I'm highlighting it. This is where you choose the number of pixels to build up your aperture and the number of pixels uh, at which to calculate the intensity on the screen. So this number, if you increase this number, you're increasing the number of pixels in your aperture. So sending out more waves from the aperture. If you make that number too low, your diffraction pattern doesn't come out very accurate. So the, the higher that number is, the more waves you're sending out you know, per square millimeter within the aperture, the more accurate the diffraction pattern will be. This is what you could, or this number is what determines what you could call the resolution of the diffraction pattern. So if you keep that number low, your circular aperture diffraction pattern will look really grainy. Uh, higher resolution would require a greater number of pixels. So obviously increasing both of these numbers would improve the image, but then it takes longer. So let's see what happens. And actually, before I do that, let me draw your attention to this line in particular. Much like the previous scripts, I've created a square or rectangular grid of points uh, representing the aperture. But because it's a circular aperture, obviously sending out waves from a rectangular region is no good. We're not going to see a, a circular aperture diffraction pattern if we've got waves coming from everywhere within a rectangle. That would be more like a single slit diffraction pattern. So what I've done here is use a, a logical operator, a Boolean, to select only those pixels from the rectangular grid which fall within a certain radius. So that's how I've set up the circular aperture. Everything else is much like it was in the previous scripts. Let's see what happens if we go with a very low number of pixels within the circular aperture and a relatively high number of pixels on the screen patch. So I'm expecting a fairly high resolution image, but possibly inaccurate. Hit play, seems to be done already. Yeah, that looks terrible. Uh, it doesn't look like a circular aperture diffraction pattern. And that is because this number is so low. So let's increase that to 50. Try again. Much better. Now, we're, we're barely encompassing the airy disk. It would be nice to see a set of circular rings around that airy disk. So what I can do is make the, the whole pattern smaller. And if we think back to the single slit, 
remember the smaller the aperture, the, the more the pattern spreads out. We actually want that pattern to collapse down so that more of it fits into the screen patch. I'm not gonna change the screen patch right now. I've already set it at, it looks like 0.02 meters or two centimeters on a side. So if I want more of those rings to fit in that same screen patch, I need, I need the diffraction pattern to collapse down a little bit. And that would mean making the diameter of the hole bigger. Counterintuitive, right? A bigger hole, a bigger circular aperture produces a diffraction pattern that's not spread out as much. It's actually collapsed down a bit. So instead of 0.2 millimeters, let's go with uh, 0.8 millimeters. Let's see what happens. Great. Now we've got the central airy disk and a number of concentric rings. And you can see how the, the rings are kinked. Once again, that's because I've chosen a small number of points for representing the circular aperture. So if I'd like the diffraction pattern to be more accurate, I need to increase that number. Of course, that means that the computation will take longer, but you've got time, right? There it is. It's interesting to ponder, what if we ask the computer to build up this diffraction pattern, not with 100, or actually it looks like here, 140 by 140 pixels, but something like a million by a million. And if we continue to zoom in, you know, would we see more and more detail in the diffraction pattern? Probably not. So it's not going to be nearly as interesting as those deep zoom videos of the Mandelbrot set. That's one of the most famous fractal patterns. Some of you may be familiar with that. Here's an image I pulled off Wikipedia. The caption here is telling us that it's actually computer generated. And what we're seeing here is the dispersion of white light as it passes not through a prism, but a small circular aperture. If you think back to the formula for the width of the airy disk, it's proportional to that ratio, lambda over A, lambda being the wavelength. So the greater the wavelength, the wider the airy disk. Red light has a longer wavelength than blue, for instance. So that means the airy disk of red light would be larger. In other words, the red light would be spread out more. It's less intense. The blue airy disk, on the other hand, would be smaller. And that means that the blue light would be more concentrated or more intense. And so you might expect that blue would slightly dominate over red at the center of this diffraction pattern. And that's what they're telling us down here that since the red component is diffracted more, meaning it's more spread out, so the red airy disk is less intense, then it's going to, be, it's going to appear slightly bluish. And some of you may have observed something like this when looking through a telescope or binoculars. Anytime light passes through some kind of aperture or diffracts around a corner, the diffraction pattern is going to depend on wavelength. So if you've ever looked through an optical instrument, or seen photographs taken through optical instruments and seen the colors of the rainbow, this is probably what you were saying, something similar to this effect. This is an actual uh, image of a diffraction pattern. It must have been from some point source of light. Maybe somebody was uh, uh, photographing a star, a bright star, or perhaps, well, I was gonna say the moon, but that, would, that doesn't work because you would definitely see the dimensions of the moon. So some far away point source of light. And I should point out that if, if you were looking through the lens of the camera, you know, whatever camera was used to take this image, your eyeball would likely not detect these rings. This could be a long exposure. Uh, remember the, the sensitivity of the human eye to light is not the same as something like photographic film or a CCD. And so it's possible that uh, you might not even see the entire airy disk. If I go back to this one, for instance, it could be because, and, and we'll look at a graph of the intensity versus radius in a moment, but it's clear that the intensity drops off with, with distance from the center. So even the edge of the airy disk is considerably less intense than the center. And it might be that your eye is not sensitive enough to detect the light coming from the edge of the airy disk. And so the effective width, the width that you might actually see 
through a telescope would be even less than the width predicted by the formula. So anybody who's interested in astronomy and the use of telescopes, it's worth keeping that in mind that that formula doesn't really predict the width of the area disk that you might see. They're telling us here in the caption that this image size is only one by one millimeter. So this is a very small diffraction pattern that we're talking about on the screen. For those of you who are curious, it's not hard to uh, pull up on Wikipedia. The actual intensity is a function of angle theta. So theta is the angle between the forward direction and the direction from the center of the aperture to the point on the screen at which we'd like to calculate the intensity. And you probably don't recognize this symbol, J1, which is the symbol used for a Bessel function of the first kind. You may encounter Bessel functions later in your career, depending on what your major is, but they're a lot like sine and cosine. They're wavy, but their amplitude drops off with, with uh, distance from the origin. And as I mentioned, if the Bessel functions are like sine and cosine, then what, what we're looking at here is kind of like sine of x over x, where I'm calling everything in here just x. This is like sine of x over x, which is what we would call the sinc function, and then you square it. I mentioned that for the single slit diffraction pattern, it really is the square of a sinc function. That's sine of some quantity over that same quantity squared. Now, this may confuse you because you're actually seeing a sine function inside the parentheses here. So it's really like a sine function within a sine function. Remember when we looked at the double slit interference pattern and the slits were separated by a distance d and d sine theta gave us the path length difference for the two waves coming from the two slits. And then we took that path length difference and used it to determine the phase difference. And that's what we plugged into a sine function. That's basically what's going on here. This quantity has to do with a path length difference it becomes the argument of a Bessel function, which is a lot like a sine function. So this is kind of like sine of x over x, where in this case, x has another sine function in it. In any case, we don't need to know this stuff for our purposes. I just thought you might appreciate the fact that the actual function for the intensity versus distance from the center of the airy disk looks a lot like the function describing the single slit interference, or I should say single slit diffraction pattern. And that doesn't surprise us uh, for the reasons we've already stated. Here's a graph of that intensity pattern. Again, this is giving intensity as a function of uh, distance, radial distance from the center of the airy disk. It looks like the single slit diffraction pattern intensity versus distance, but it's not exactly the same. So this has the overall shape of a sinc squared function, but we've seen it's actually a Bessel function of an argument over that argument squared. Now, why is this so important to us? Well, we are talking about wave optics and we've spent some time looking at applications of those ideas to optical instruments, including the human eye, microscopes, telescopes, and all of those involve diffraction of light through a circular aperture. In the case of a reflecting telescope, first the light has to pass through the opening of the scope itself, and then it reflects off of a circular mirror. You can also see it's going to diffract around these uh, support structures here. That's the origin of those diffraction spikes that I mentioned. If this was a refracting telescope, you would have a glass lens, typically also circular, uh, the human pupil, of course, is a circle. So lots of common examples of visible light passing through a circular aperture. Now, if you're looking at a couple point sources of light, stars are very far away. So despite the fact that they are enormous and spherical in shape, at a distance of light years, they look like point sources of light. And that means that the waves arriving at Earth from those stars are basically plane waves. And when those plane waves pass through the circular opening of a telescope, we expect to get diffraction. Now in the Python simulation, I chose a circular aperture that was something like two millimeters, or I think it was even like half a millimeter across. This circular aperture is much greater in diameter 
Nonetheless, we know that light exhibits wave behavior. And so we would expect to see uh, some manifestation of that even for an aperture this large. So the problem with that is if you're trying to produce an image where you can clearly distinguish two point sources of light, each of those sources of light will have its own circular aperture diffraction pattern on, let's say your retina, if you're the person looking through the eyepiece, or if you're using this telescope to take a picture, uh, these could be the images produced on the photographic film or on the CCD. So the diffraction patterns from these two point sources of light obviously overlap. And that may make it difficult to resolve the images of those two point sources. So here's a sequence of images showing how if the diffraction patterns overlap too much, then the images become indistinguishable. Clearly your eyeball or your brain would perceive this just as one source of light. You wouldn't look at this and recognize that there were two stars near each other. So here we would say that these two point sources of light have been resolved because their airy disks don't overlap at all. These you might say are marginally resolved and these are certainly not resolved. So if you'd like to come up with a formula that, that indicates marginal resolution, well, then you can read about the Rayleigh criterion, which is discussed in a future video. But you can't understand the meaning of that formula or that, that criteria, criterion, I should say criterion, that's the singular of criteria. You can't understand that without first uh, understanding circular aperture diffraction. Now, if you make this uh, telescope aperture large enough, these concentric rings will collapse down real tightly around the airy disk. And it will look real close to being just one dot on your, your film. Remember that W is the width of the airy disk inside each of the diffraction patterns. And capital D is the diameter of the aperture. In this case, capital D would be much greater than W. A bit of a non sequitur here, but I pulled up an image showing the various diffraction spikes that result from different configurations of support structures. So maybe you've got a secondary mirror inside your telescope. It needs to be mounted somehow. You can't just levitate it in space, at least not with most telescopes. And as the light diffracts around those, those thin bars, you get the diffraction spikes. Spike. So how do you get rid of those concentric rings that possibly make it difficult to resolve two point sources of light? And they don't have to be two stars. It could just be two details on a larger object. Maybe you'd like to uh, distinguish one side of a crater on the moon from the other side of the crater. After all, if you can't distinguish the two sides of the crater, then you can't really tell it's a crater, right? So the, the finer detail you'd like to see, the more you need to collapse those circular aperture diffraction patterns. And that means you need to increase the diameter, capital D, of your aperture. In other words, make a really big telescope. So here's a great example on Mauna Kea. That's the top of a mountain in Hawaii. And you can see here, these are the, the apertures. Now, it's a little abstract to think about a mirror as an aperture, but whether light as a wave is passing through a hole or reflecting off of something shaped like a circle, uh, the analysis is very much the same. It's difficult to appreciate just how large these mirrors are. And it looks like we've got the honeycomb design. It's actually um, a couple dozen mirrors arranged so that they act like one big mirror. Check it out, these are vehicles. Can you see these cars? That tells you just how big these mirrors are. And it's amazing. Uh, the, the level of detail that you can see when you've got telescopes this big. By the way, this is called the Keck telescope. And isn't it cool to think about these basically as two giant eyeballs, right? A lot of animals have two eyeballs mounted on either side of their heads with pupils. That's what we're looking at here. Humans have constructed this giant 
set of eyeballs that allows them to see much further into the universe than they would otherwise, and a level of detail um, heretofore impossible. Of course, this telescope has been around for a while. There's the location of the mountain. There's a lot of telescopes there operated by a number of different countries. And this is one of the most impressive images I'm aware of produced by the Keck telescope. This was used, or this was taken not with visible light, but I believe infrared light. So before I explain what you're looking at here, can you take a guess? What does this mean down here? 20 AU. AU means astronomical unit. So this is a, a scale bar. They're telling us that this distance in the picture represents 20 astronomical units. Well, that's 20 times the distance from Earth to Sun. So well, obviously we're not looking at some small feature on the moon. We're looking at something much larger. And uh, the only objects which could span such a great e expanse of space would be planets and stars. So the star has been blocked so that the, the light from the star doesn't overwhelm the light coming from the planets. As far as I'm aware of, this is one of the only direct images of planets orbiting a star. Did you even know that that existed? That you could Google a picture of faraway planets orbiting another star. Now, you're probably aware that thousands of planets, uh, so-called exoplanets, have now been confirmed to orbit other stars within our galaxy, but there's not too many actual pictures. Most of the methods for, uh, for locating those planets have been indirect. Here's an actual image of those planets orbiting their host star. Now, some of the light coming off the planets, uh, I'm guessing would be reflected light, but it could also just be infrared. Uh, warm objects radiate infrared light, just like you know a rattlesnake perhaps can see you in the dark. Uh, the camera on board this telescope is able to see the infrared light being emitted by those planets. Okay, and 20 AU, that tells us that this planet, for instance, and this one are really far. If you're curious about the letters here, usually the star is just given a number for a name, and then the planets have letters appended to that number. So the star we're looking at is called HR8799. Notice there's no letter after that. And then uh, the first planet discovered near that star is probably given the letter A. Next planet would be given a letter B, etc. Here's a particular planet they're referring to, HR8799C. That's perhaps the third planet that was discovered near that star. 129 light years away. Now, given the fact that this is 20 AU, you could easily calculate uh, the distance across this image. You could then take, uh, I'll call it the arc tangent of this distance divided by 129 light years. And that would give you the, uh, the angular size of this image. You know, how many uh, arc seconds, for instance, across the, the sky are we looking at? I'm showing you this because there's no way you could see this kind of detail without a really big telescope. Uh, it's just impossible to produce images like this because each of these, uh, I'll call them point sources of light for a normal telescope would produce uh, diffraction patterns, circular aperture diffraction patterns that would have a whole bunch of concentric rings and those rings would overlap with the rings from this one. So I'm just gonna venture a guess here. If you tried to look at something like this through a normal telescope that was even like two feet in diameter or the aperture was two feet in diameter, all of this would just look like a single blob. Truthfully, you probably wouldn't see anything because the light coming from something this far away would be too dim to even be detected by a normal sized telescope. But su supposing it was an extremely sensitive telescope as far as uh, picking up light, like it, it gathered every single photon coming from uh, some direction in space, it would still be a blob because of diffraction. Um, the resolution of an image is diffraction limited. Whoa, so even bigger. If, what if you'd like to see even finer details? Instead of looking at uh, planets orbiting stars 100 light years away, 
what if you'd like to look at the details of a galaxy that's like a million light years away? You're going to need a much bigger telescope even. Now, this is a radio telescope, so it, it looks at light uh, arriving here at Earth, not in the visible spectrum, but in the radio part of the spectrum, so much longer wavelengths. But this one was built into a natural sinkhole in the Earth down in Puerto Rico. And you may have heard that just recently, December of last year, it collapsed. Uh, I think they got decades of service out of this radio telescope. It, it never managed to confirm the existence of aliens anyway, so I guess it was a failure in that sense. But I'm sure they did lots of cool things with this telescope. What was it with 2020, man? Just a bad year. What a way to close out that year. Even bigger. Okay, well, we're not looking at one single satellite dish or uh, radio antenna that's this big across. That would be very difficult to construct, right? Imagine the weight of something that large, the, the cost because of the materials and assembling it and transporting all the materials to the construction site, not feasible. But uh, through this process called interferometry, you can get an array of separate telescopes to behave a lot like one giant telescope. So it, it can't be as good, right? But surprisingly, uh, it, it looks like we're looking at something like two dozen telescopes here. I forget the exact number. In fact, I think it's 66 now. I think there are 66 separate antennas. You can get them to act a lot like one giant telescope using interferometry. So this is the, the famous ALMA Observatory. It's in the Atacama Desert down in Chile. Uh, this is a beautiful place. I've never been there, but uh, occasionally they get rain in the desert. And this is really high up. I think this plateau is like 14,000 feet, which is higher than our local mountain, Mount Baldy. But every once in a while, they get heavy rains and this entire desert is covered with purple flowers. 16,000 feet, even higher than I quoted. Cost a lot of money. I think this is the most expensive, right? Ground-based telescope. There are more expensive telescopes that have been put up, but they're in space. So the Hubble telescope, I think, has cost more. And right now they're working on the James Webb Space Telescope. That's going to be even more expensive, but that's because they're launching it into space. Here's an image from when they just had three of them hooked up, working as an interferometer, you know, like a big telescope. Uh, I'm showing you these images to emphasize you need a large aperture, a large value of capital D if you expect to get high resolution. If you want those uh, circular aperture diffraction patterns to be really small so that they don't overlap, you've got to have large apertures. What an incredible image produced by Alma in conjunction with Hubble. And one of my favorites is this one. I remember when this surfaced in the year 2014. You might not find this particularly impressive at first because you've seen, uh, well, for instance, you've seen much more beautiful images of faraway galaxies. But what you're looking at here is a close-up view of a single star and a solar system in formation around that star. Early in the formation of our own solar system, there was probably way more hydrogen gas in the space within uh, the planetary orbit. So it's just a giant cloud of gas and dust, the size of our solar system. And most of that is gone now. It's either been accreted onto planets or it's been moved out of the solar system. But you might imagine that as those planets are forming early in the history, remember our solar system is supposed to be something like 4.6 billion years old. So it may have taken tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years uh, to reach a point where it looked like it's uh, present structure. But during that time, you, you might imagine that those planets are clearing out these orbital paths. And that's what we're looking at here. Those dark rings indicate the presence of newly formed planets. And I guess they learned some important stuff from this picture. It turns out that the speed at which solar systems form may be considerably greater than was previously thought. So this is called a protoplanetary disk. 
And the name here just indicates where in the sky this particular star is found. So huge deal back in 2014, at the first image of its kind. And since that time, the same observatory has produced many similar images of other protoplanetary disks. So you're not looking at faraway galaxies here. Uh, galaxies are millions of light years away, or at least hundreds of thousands of light years away. Each of these images is uh, a solar system that's probably just a few dozen light years away. But the scale is much smaller, right? A galaxy is, let's just say, 100,000 times wider than a single solar system. Even that's probably a low number. So it's kind of insane, the level of detail that you're looking at here. You're basically looking at tiny little planets orbiting uh, separate stars very far from here. Can you get any bigger than that? I showed the picture of the, the telescopes across, uh, what was that, a mile out in the desert. Can you go any bigger than that? Well, what about telescopes on opposite sides of the world? Can you turn the entire Earth into an interferometer? A and then why even stop there? Why not put more telescopes out in space, far from the Earth, and then make this entire thing act like one giant telescope? And that's the idea behind VLBI, very long baseline interferometry. That is one large aperture telescope. You might expect to see really small details with that. So you can read about this if you're interested in it. And one of the most famous images produced by VLBI, I think a year ago from the recording of this video was this one, an image of a black hole at the center of our galaxy. And it looks pretty complicated. Telescopes all over the Earth. They made the entire Earth act like one giant telescope. Go big or go home. I don't know what any of this stuff means, so don't ask me. I mean, I'm just here to tell you that the larger the aperture, the smaller the detail you can see, and it has to do with the wave behavior of light. There's one more topic requiring our consideration at this time, and that's the question of exactly when it's necessary to use the wave model of light versus the ray model. Very often when we're analyzing the behavior of light after it passes through lenses or bounces off mirrors, it's sufficient to just represent light as uh, with rays and look at the law of reflection, Snell's law, and that's enough to determine uh, the nature of an image produced by an optical system. In other cases, you've got to use the wave behavior of light to appropriately describe what happens. So let me remind you that if you use the small angle approximation, the angle theta one to the first interference minimum, or I should say first diffraction minimum for a single slit is really just given by the ratio of the wavelength of light to the slit width. And this is true, not just for light waves, but also for sound waves. I mentioned this is why base frequencies are really good at penetrating through walls and uh, spreading out around corners because the wavelength of low frequency sound waves is greater than high frequency sound waves. And so there tends to be more spreading when the light passes through, or excuse me, when the sound passes through a gap. So you can see here that the wavelength of this particular wave is much less than the wavelength of this wave. And that's why the second wave spreads out quite a bit more than this one does. So the amount of spreading or the amount of diffraction depends on how the wavelength relates to the size of the aperture. That's just as true for circular aperture diffraction as it is for diffraction through a single slit. We've already seen that as the diameter capital D of the hole goes down, the width W of the airy disk goes up. Now, unfortunately, the Falstead Ripple Tank doesn't have an option for circular aperture diffraction, but the main features of the pattern can be explored just with the single slit setup. So here you've got the central maximum, secondary maxima off to the side. And we can mess with the source frequency, which is really the wavelength, right? As you increase the frequency, you decrease the wavelength. So what's, what happens if I leave the slit width the same, but I decrease the wavelength? 
In other words, increase the frequency. Note that there is less spreading. The central maximum gets narrower as the wavelength goes down. So when the wavelength is short compared to the slit width, or in this case, the, uh, the circular aperture diameter, when the wavelength is really small compared to that dimension, there's less spreading. So can we take that to the extreme? Uh, what happens if I make the slit width as large as possible? Well, maybe not quite yet. I'll leave it in the middle. Do you see all these secondary maxima off to the side? But they're all collapsed down more than they were before. So if I narrow the slit, then everything is spread out more. And it's a little hard to, to see that because of course, if I increase the slit width, then you've got a greater beam of light making it through. But look at the directions that these secondary maxima make. If I make the slit width smaller, you should see that uh, these directions open up. Yeah. Maybe just focus your attention on one of those secondary maxima, like this one that I'm outlining with my mouse. Watch what happens to the direction of that one as I open the slit up. Yeah, it's moving back towards the center. So think of this as the airy disk, right? If this slit right here represents a circular aperture, then this forward beam, when it intercepts the screen, would really give you the airy disk. And all of these secondary maxima uh, on the other sides or on either side of the beam would give you those concentric rings. So is it possible to get the airy disk to be even smaller than the, uh, the diameter of the hole? What I'm going to do is open the slit width all the way up and make the wavelength as short as possible. And of course, we can't really see anything now. So let me zoom out. And I will increase the brightness because it looks like there are no secondary maxima now. It's like those concentric rings have disappeared, but look, they're still there. They were just too dim to be seen. So look at all these secondary maxima. When they intercept the screen, that's the source of those concentric rings. And you'll notice that the airy disk here is just slightly greater in width than the circular aperture itself. So I'm hoping you can see the crossover point between the need for wave optics and ray optics being a sufficient description. Because now uh, the, the intensity of those concentric rings off to the side is so weak. Basically, we've collapsed the, the circular aperture diffraction pattern down. There's a whole bunch of concentric rings near uh, the central, uh, the airy disk. They're just so close that you, uh, it looks like they're part of the disk. So we're almost looking here at the geometric shadow of the circular aperture. Okay, so make the, if you make the diameter of the aperture much greater than the wavelength of light, then the picture you get, uh, the diffraction pattern you get almost doesn't look like a diffraction pattern at all. Can I make that more exaggerated? What if I decrease the slit width, increase the brightness? Yeah, so this is obviously a case where you would need wave optics. There's significant spreading of the light. Look at the central maximum. It's definitely wider than the slit is. On the other side of the, uh, the possibilities here, we make the slit width very wide. The wavelength as short as possible. That means high frequency. And it, it looks like what you would expect to see if you shine a laser beam through a circular hole. You would expect that the dot, and when I say expect, I mean if you had never taken optics, you would expect that the dot seen on the screen has the same diameter as the width of the aperture. Okay, so that happens in the limit where the slit width is much greater than the wavelength of light. So this is this picture we're looking at here is sh very short wavelength uh, compared to the diameter of the hole. Let's try to relate what we just saw in the Falstead ripple tank to this picture here. Think of this arrow as representing an incident laser beam. So the diameter of the beam is wider than the hole. And the only light that makes it through, of course, is the light within the hole.
if we did not have to worry about diffraction at all, we could just use the ray model of light and draw a line from each point on the aperture to each point on the screen. On the other hand, if we did have to worry about uh, the wave nature of light and we had a diffraction pattern that was significantly larger than the geometric shadow here. So this would be the geometric shadow of the hole. And you'll notice that I've drawn the airy disk considerably wider than that geometric shadow. So don't be confused by this lighter shade circle here. This is supposed to represent the shadow of the hole, but the airy disk would be this. So obviously different from your expectations if you had not studied optics before. If this is the, the scenario, then clearly the ray model of light is totally insufficient for predicting the behavior of the light after it passes through the hole. So as a general rule, if the width of the airy disk is greater than the diameter of the hole, and hence the diameter of the geometric shadow of the hole, then ray optics or the ray model of light will not be good enough. You're going to have to consider diffraction. Here's the opposite case. Think back to the Falstad ripple tank when I made the slit width as large as possible and the wavelength as short as possible. We saw that all of those concentric rings of interference maxima collapsed down around the central maximum. And that's what we see here. I've drawn several of those concentric rings really close to the airy disk. So when the aperture is large compared to the wavelength, the whole diffraction pattern collapses down and your uh, airy disk is just slightly greater in diameter than the geometric shadow of the hole. So if that's the case, then you can go with the ray model of light. Ray optics will be sufficient for describing the behavior of light after it passes through the hole. Okay, so that crossover point, again, your, your book talks about it as if the airy disk could be greater or less than the, the width of the hole in diameter. Uh, and so they call that equality, the crossover point. Let's just say that when the, when the, Airy disk's width, W, gets down uh, to about the diameter of the hole. So that's what I've shown here. The purple disk, that's the airy disk in the diffraction pattern. And this black circle shows the geometric shadow of the hole. So the airy disk is still a little bit wider, but not by much. And the, the circular aperture diffraction pattern has largely collapsed down onto the airy disk. When that happens, we'll call that the crossover point between validity and non-validity of the ray model. Well, we have a formula for the width of the airy disk. It's this formula right here. So of course it depends on the size of the hole. And what we're saying is the width of the airy disk needs to be approximately equal to the geometric shadow of the hole. And of course the, the geometric shadow has the same diameter of the hole. So instead of just capital D, we're calling it capital D sub C for uh, the crossover diameter. When the, when the size of your hole is large enough, we could put it that way, when you, as long as it's large enough in comparison to the wavelength of light, everything is collapsed down and the area disk is, a, is approximately the same in diameter as the hole. Okay, so notice that D makes an appearance twice in this formula, let's solve this formula for capital D. And what did I do here? 2.44, practically the same as two. I mean, we're being very casual here because this whole condition is rather approximate anyway. So one sig fig would be just fine. Solve this for D squared. Lastly, take the square root. And here's our magic formula that gives us a criterion 
for deciding whether we need to use wave optics or we need to use ray optics. When you're using ray diagrams to calculate the location and height of an image produced by one or several lenses, it may be totally unnecessary to take into account the wave nature of light. How do you know for sure whether it's necessary? Well, you choose a representative wavelength, something like 500 nanometers for visible light. You choose the distance between the optical element like the lens and the screen where the image is formed. You plug those in, see what pops out. So let's use some characteristic numbers here. 500 nanometers, somewhere in the middle of the visible range. And then we'll go with the usual one meter. Uh, in, in many of the multiple slit setups that we looked at, the distance between the slits and the screen was something like one meter. Or if you had some lenses set up on an optics bench to do um, a physics lab experiment, that distance would also be something like one meter. And these numbers work out nicely, because check it out. If you plug in one for L, that's right here, and then 500 nanometers, if you take the decimal point after the 500 and move it three to the left, then you've already used up three of those negative powers of 10. So instead of 10 to the negative ninth, now we're talking about 10 to the negative sixth. So I like to just memorize this, that the wavelength of light is about one half of a micrometer. Plug that in down here. Do you see how the two and the one half just make one? So we really only have to take the square root of one millionth, which is of course, one thousandth. That's a thousandth of a meter because I'm using SI units and a thousandth of a meter is one millimeter. It's kind of just a cool coincidence that it works out that way because that's a very convenient number and a convenient unit. As long as the aperture of your um, circle is on the order of one millimeter or greater, then you don't have to worry so much about the wavelength of light. Ray optics should suffice. So let's look at this lab setup here. We've got a lens with a circular aperture and there's a screen about a meter away. Uh, same thing with this aperture. Both of these apertures are significantly greater than one millimeter, at least 10 times as great, probably more like 50 times as great. So for this setup, there wouldn't be much need to consider the wave nature of light. We're not gonna expect to see concentric rings of a diffraction pattern as the light passes through the circular aperture. On the other hand, if you were dealing with the PASCO multiple slit wheel, where each of these slits is less than a millimeter in width, sometimes significantly, significantly less than that. For instance, right here, they're giving us the slit width A as 0.04 millimeters. 0.04 is significantly less than one. And that means that ray optics would not be valid. Of course, that's the whole point of this uh, piece from PASCO is to investigate diffraction and interference patterns. So nice, easy number to memorize. And that begs the question, doesn't it? What about the human eye as an optical system? If we think about the aperture, which is the pupil, is it necessary to take into account the wave nature of light? Hmm.